I'm Dr. Christopher Chauncey Watson, Global Marketing Director for Global HIV Franchise at Gilead Sciences. And I'm Dr. David Malbranche, Senior Director of Global HIV Medical Affairs at Gilead Sciences. And welcome to another episode of Zero Hour, a global podcast brought to you by Gilead Sciences. In this podcast, we speak with leading global health and culture experts to understand the barriers that keep people from meaningful and transformative care. We'll shed light on inequity, we'll celebrate innovation, and together, we'll imagine a world with zero barriers, zero disparities, zero new infections, and zero people left behind. It's possible, but there's zero time to wait. How do you fix something that's broken? If your car engine is having issues, you call a mechanic. If your roof gets damaged in a storm, you call a contractor. But how do you fix a broken healthcare system? How do you remove structural discrimination and HIV stigma from the very institutions that are meant to protect you? Before those communities that have often been overlooked and ignored can be served by our healthcare systems, we have to accept that our so-called experts don't have all the answers. Instead, we have to talk to the people we're trying to reach and ask them what they need and actually listen. Only then can we begin to earn their trust and prove that the injustice that they've come to expect won't be repeated. Our guests today are two people who have unique perspectives on how systems of care can either support health equity or create barriers to health care for people from traditionally marginalized communities. Dr. Kevin Fenton provides leadership as the Regional Director for London in the Department of Health and the Social Care's Office for Health Improvement and Disparities. In addition to decades of work as a leader and advisor for U.S. and global HIV policy, he is current Public Health England's Senior Advisor for HIV and Sexual and Reproductive Health and also advises the Mayor of London and the Greater London Authority. Dr. Oni Blackstock is a primary care and HIV physician, researcher, and founder and executive director of Health Justice, which centers anti-racism and equity in the workplace and helps organizations reduce health inequities in the communities that they serve. She previously served as assistant commissioner for the Bureau of HIV for the New York City Department of Health, where she led the city's response to the HIV epidemic with a particular focus on the impacts of the epidemic in women and other marginalized groups. Welcome to you both. Dr. Blackstock, why is the work that you do around HIV and health equity so important to you? Well, when I think about um, medicine and healthcare, I really can't think of any other medical condition that has such stark inequities. And this is the case across race, um, gender, sexuality, as HIV does. And so for me, it's sort of been a lens through which I've really come to understand how these larger systems of racism and homophobia and transphobia lead to adverse health outcomes and disproportionately impact certain communities versus others. We all have this beginning moment that gets us into public health. And so for me, I started public health um, because my best friend said, here's some condoms, go out to the club, pass them out, and here's what you say. So uh, Dr. Blackstock, how did you get started in this, this career? So when I was in medical school, I had a mentor, Dr. Joyce Saki, who was from Ghana in West Africa, and she provided me this amazing opportunity to travel there to do an HIV treatment adherence study. So seeing whether patients who were prescribed HIV treatment were taking their medications as prescribed. And so I was able to travel to this an HIV clinic in Accra called the Fevers Unit. And the Fevers Unit was literally located outside the hospital campus in this tiny corner. And it was marginalized much in the same way I thought the patients or observed the patients to be marginalized. And I met a woman and her daughter and the woman shared with me, even though she had started treatment, even though she was doing well, that her family had banished she and her daughter to a room in their house and they couldn't use the bathroom or the kitchen. And so it just really struck me at that point how much HIV stigma, um, the impact of it. Well, I came back to New York City to do an away elective in the Bronx, in Central Harlem, in Brooklyn, and just saw HIV stigma there, marginalization there, many of the same issues. And I think for me, that was when I was 
committed myself to a career in, in HIV medicine. One of the questions we wanted to ask you was about the impact of racism and sexism, and it's heavy in your research and all the work that you do on people, especially Black communities, mental and physical health. How did that shape your approach to HIV when you were working at the New York City Department of Health? I've always done you know, racial equity work. You know, My research was focused on Black and Latina, cisgender women, then trans women, um, Black men, Latino men. But when I went to the health department, um, they had just started a reform initiative called Race to Justice, really this agency-wide effort to really understand how does racism impact adverse health outcomes and really developing a language to talk about that, not to shy away from it, and also overhauled all aspects of um, the sort of the agency in terms of how we engage with the community, how we communicate, what our priorities are. Man, I was like, okay, great, we're going to do this, created a racial equity and social justice initiatives bureau. We became much more explicit when we talked about what are the root causes of HIV inequities. A lot of times we would see poverty, unemployment, but what are the root causes of those? Why are they disproportionately impacting certain communities versus others? Right. Um, and so it was a really wonderful opportunity to really talk about um, equity and its impact on the HIV epidemic and wh what we need to do to end the epidemic. One thing that we did notice is that there is a huge uh, misalignment in terms of where the need exists um, and where the resources are going. And so using an equity framework, we created programs such as, um, you know, looking at grassroots organizations that were led by Black same-gender loving men or by Latina and Black trans women. These are the organizations that are on the front lines. They are the best positioned to engage the communities that are most impacted. They're the ones that really should be getting much of the funds. Dr. Fenton, you grew up in Jamaica to a family of modest means. Medicine was a way to leave Jamaica, but also help lift your family up. What was happening in health when you first started thinking about medicine as your profession? I first didn't want to be a physician. Um, you know, growing up, I wanted to uh, study languages, fly around the world. But I think it was the first reported cases of what then became known as AIDS in the early 1980s that really both caught my attention, but also got me very much interested in health. My mom was a nurse, my father is a science teacher. And it was that moment in time where we saw the beginning of this unknown disease, this pandemic starting. And at that time, it was, I need to be a part of this. I want to be part of being involved in solving and being a part of finding solutions for this, this challenge. And even at the beginning, in the early 1980s, when those first cases were appearing, you could see the inequalities that were beginning to appear almost immediately. The concentration of new infections uh, and cases among gay and bisexual men, among people who uh, use drugs, among certain racial and ethnic groups. We began to see the emergence of the inequalities, which have become uh, definitional of the HIV pandemic appearing then. And that also was a source of inspiration and focus for me at that time. Dr. Blackstock, why is focusing on addressing inequity so important, particularly for HIV? I saw this modeling study that was done um, looking at different cities throughout the country and looking at different groups of people. We have ended the HIV epidemic, for instance, among white New Yorkers. We will not end the HIV epidemic among Black and Latino New Yorkers until probably 2040, if not later. This is not okay, and we shouldn't be okay with this. We need really to put resources, um, investment in addressing these inequities in HIV, because really they're reflective of, lar of larger issues, right? It's around housing, employment, so, stigma. Yeah, so people look at the overall, like you look at trends, say, in the United States, for an example, as a country, and you see the trends in overall new cases of HIV going down, and people celebrate that, what would you tell them? Well, I think it's encouraging that we're having these declines, you know, over this long period of time. However, we're seeing starker inequities. I often talk about, like, the browning of the HIV epidemic, meaning although the number of people who are being diagnosed with HIV is decreasing year over year, uh, the proportion of people who are Black and Latino 
are is increasing among that group. So there's a really exciting and innovative study that's underway called Getting to Zero that's focused on Black men who have sex with men in the South. And it uses a multi-level intervention to see what impact that has on viral suppression and PrEP uptake. And what is really exciting about it is that it's really working to address some of those root causes that we've talked about, racism, homophobia, HIV stigma. And what it's doing, for instance, is ensuring that all staff at these healthcare facilities receive uh, anti-racism training, particularly anti-Black racism training, uh, training in anti-homophobia and HIV stigma, really giving people the opportunity to critically sort of reflect on their own beliefs and how that might impact the way that they provide care or interact with patients. Um, they're also getting folks to be organizational champions to really look at the way that services overall are delivered and the, how they can be delivered in a way that's affirming and validating to Black same gender loving men. And they're also doing some work with with outside of healthcare, um, with housing groups, with um, employment groups, recognizing that to end the epidemic and to support Black men, we need to go outside the healthcare setting and partner with other folks who all play a role in ensuring that people are having lives in which they are fulfilled, are able to engage in healthcare, and are able to do things to, um, to stay healthy. You know, if someone has HIV, but they don't have housing, that's going to impact their ability to take their HIV treatment. If they have HIV, they don't have a job, they're probably not going to have health insurance. They're probably going to deal with food insecurity, and finding food is going to take priority over taking your medication. Uh, Professor Fenton, why is focusing and addressing inequality so critically important to go global efforts on ending the HIV epidemic? It is absolutely clear in trying to manage or control any health condition, certainly any infectious disease, that you will not achieve both ending or eliminating transmission unless everybody is engaged, unless all uh, voices are heard, unless all communities are part of finding solutions. We've known this for other conditions, other health conditions, other infectious diseases. We're seeing this with COVID. We're seeing this with HIV. We have to bake in. We have to build systems which fundamentally understand and respond to inequalities. Again, using the example of COVID, where we failed to engage communities, we saw high levels of vaccine hesitancy, poor outcomes with COVID as we went through various phases of the pandemic. For HIV, poor engagement or lack of engagement with communities, a failure to listen to what really matters to communities, a failure to tackle the structural drivers of inequalities, means that we see further concentration of disease among those who are most vulnerable, least engaged in care, or those who have poorest access to care. So we fail to address equity at or peril when it comes to health and infectious diseases. What are some things that providers and clinics themselves can do to help uh, their patients and clin uh, clients prevent HIV? Providers do, I think, play an important role. I think especially, for instance, when we think about PrEP, I mean, providers are gatekeepers to PrEP. And so if they are not talking to all of their patients about it, about it, that's a missed opportunity. So there should be really universal education about PrEP. And I always say, like, PrEP may not be for everyone, but everyone should know about it. Right. And what does it stand for, the acronym? So PrEP stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis. Pre-exposure prophylaxis means that someone is taking um, this prevention medication as prescribed uh, before they may have a potential exposure to HIV so that it's on board and it can prevent them from getting HIV if they are exposed. Much has been written on the history of racism in healthcare. One of my favorite uh, biblical moments for me is Medical Apartheid by Harriet Washington, who really takes it back to slavery and that impact. When we look at the pandemic of COVID, uh, how has the awareness and impacts of racism changed how we are approaching the care? So I think the pandemic has definitely shown a spotlight on the existence of health inequity. So there's increased attention, I think, as a result of the pandemic among the general population. And I think what would be helpful is to also see a similar sort of investment in terms of funding and resources in how do we begin to intervene on these disparities that we see. So it's really about interventions. How do we intervene? How do we move to action in terms of not just reducing them, but eliminating them?
Professor Fenton, we've defined inequities. We have talked about the root of inequities. How do we begin to address inequities? It is so important that we continue to have these conversations and we need to continue to expand these conversations. So it's not people, only people who look like us who are talking about racism, talking about inequalities, but it's seen as an issue for all of us, for all of us from whatever backgrounds that wherever this type of injustice is occurring, all of us are, are losing as a result of it. So there are three things I often say we need to do. The first is that we have to say it. We have to call out these inequalities. Second, I ask colleagues to think about how are these inequalities being driven in the work that we're doing? What are the factors which are making it worse? And then third, we have been saying to everybody that it's all of our uh, responsibilities to ensure we're acting on what we have named and what we see. And that action can be at the individual level where we use our voices, we use the resources that we have to both call out those inequalities, advocate for change, and be part of the solution. And for those of us who have the privilege of leading organizations to be in that space where we are leveraging the organization's assets to tackle the inequalities, including structural racism. So part of that might be a leadership voice, ensuring that there's a strong executive leadership and management around tackling inequalities, being anti-racist. Some of it is about creating healthy spaces for employees of all backgrounds to thrive in our organizations so we can do our best for our employees, especially our black and minority ethnic employees. Some of it is about delivering new programs, which really cut to um, the culturally competent pro programming that we need to see to tackle health inequalities. And of course, some of it involves ways in which we bring communities into the center of our work, where we co-produce uh, programs which speak to the needs of communities today, not of communities of 10 or 20 years ago, but that we work with communities to develop programs that matter to them and that are effective for them. Did you see a lot of comparisons being made between COVID-19 and HIV? For me personally, what I thought immediately was we both are in pandemics or epidemics of inequality. I know a lot of colleagues compared the government's response, its sort of delayed and inadequate response, to what we saw at the beginning of the AIDS epidemic. We also saw, again, vulnerable groups, um, communities being impacted by COVID, similarly to the AIDS epidemic. We also saw discussions around harm reduction, right? Like we think about harm reduction in terms of HIV and sexually transmitted infections in terms of promoting condoms, for instance, so that people can reduce their risk of acquiring HIV and other sexually transmitted infections. And we saw that parallel made to wearing masks. So I think that there were a, a number of similarities that, that definitely were highlighted um, and that existed. And I always say like there's so much about from HIV that we have learned and did apply and could have applied better during the pandemic. Dr. Fenton, what are some of the key themes that emerged from the most recent UK HIV stigma survey you conducted? The survey itself engages people living with HIV and asks them about various domains of stigma, their lived experience, how they see it operating. And we're seeing some really interesting uh, signals. First, we see that for people living with HIV, stigma within healthcare services remains a real challenge uh, for many individuals. And this is not necessarily from their HIV provider. It can be from the nurse who's taking the blood. It can be the person in the accident and emergency department. It can be their primary care provider. Second, we see differences in the experience of stigma depending on who you are and where you are within society. So we see different patterns of stigma manifesting itself uh, for gay men, depending on age, racial and ethnic background, for uh, the people who are living with HIV who've acquired it through heterosexual transmission. We see that, for example, for migrant African communities. And part of that stigma is the interface with other structural barriers for care, including uh, racism. Finally, a key finding of the survey is that we, we're seeing where we have positive benefits uh, and where things are going better. So we're seeing less experience of stigma within specialist services as people are used to providing care to people living with HIV and engaging with communities. And we're also seeing the importance of the interfaces between 
mental health and HIV, and how that can both worsen stigma, but where done right, that can be a really effective way of addressing stigma as well. I remember when I first got into working with HIV and doing research, one of the first studies I conducted was a qualitative study with black gay men who were in New York City and upstate New York. And some were HIV negative, some were living with HIV. And what came across all the time was how they had stigma experiences, not only around HIV, around race, around sexual orientation, but it threaded through their entire experience navigating the healthcare profession from the front desk, to the medical assistant, to the nurse, to the phlebotomist, to the primary care provider, to the tech, everybody was involved. So I think the point here is to make is not just clinicians that are enacting stigma on people with HIV, it's the entire healthcare system and how that can impact somebody and make them not want to return, not want to engage, not want to access the care that's meant for their benefit. And you think about the 1980s, and so much has changed now, especially with the options of where people can get their healthcare information. What are you seeing in terms of where people are getting health information about HIV nowadays? People don't read articles anymore. M- many people don't. Most people get their information from, from videos, from clips. Um, for, so, for instance, I have a, a, a close colleague, um, Dr. James Simmons, and he has a TikTok account where he is always talking about HIV, HIV prevention, sexual health, and he has the most amazing engagement, but they're real, authentic, important conversations that are happening. So I think social media plays a really important role in this as well. I think one of the things that we learned with COVID-19 and like the accessibility of information is that it can be both a blessing and a curse. And to me, I saw it as a wake-up call for healthcare providers because we saw a lot of people with COVID-19 who didn't have any public health background, no virology background, no history of dealing with any kind of pandemics, viral pandemics, all of a sudden spouting themselves as experts and saying certain things. And it was a wake up call for me because I thought, well, the healthcare community, we're not engaged in these social media platforms as much. And we should be. Right. You were very active on Twitter, you know, as was I, in terms of COVID and sharing information. I think people really responded to that. I think because there are many people who don't have a primary care provider or someone that they can go to, someone trusted to get this information. So I think, you know, we play an important role, not to (laughs) to hype ourselves up, but I I, I do think we were important resources. (laughs) But I think this idea of trusted messengers, and and that can happen via social media, it can be via community-based organizations, faith-based organizations. If there are folks who are already identified in communities as folks who people trust, we need to be partnering with those individuals or health departments and hospitals and healthcare systems need to be doing that because these um, individuals represent an entry point um, for um, for lots of information yeah. and resources. Are you telling us that the messenger matters? The messenger is critically important. Yes, the messenger totally matters. It's been an evolution talking about training healthcare providers. Can you talk about the difference between cultural competency and cultural humility when it comes to HIV care? So I think of cultural competency more as sort of this sort of stereotyped cluster of maybe characteristics that we think about when we think about different groups of people. Cultural humility, on the other hand, I think recognizes that we are lifelong learners and we are never going to fully understand um, what is happening or the practices and behaviors of all cultures. I think what those two areas are lacking is there is a lack of recognition of, of structures, of power. So there is um, a new uh, concept called structural competency, and it's really when health professionals understand what are the underlying systems and policies and social hierarchies that lead to poverty and inequality and that then lead to health inequities. So it's a recognition of sort of those structural determinants of health on top of which the social determinants like housing, our living environment, green space, all that stuff sits on. Um, So it's getting to the root causes because if we don't know what the root causes are, we can't develop effective solutions. It's the difference between highlighting what it is about the patient that's sitting in front of you 
and like you said, stereotyping them from actually putting the mirror on yourself and yeah. saying, how can I do better? How can I connect to this person? What can I do to make them feel more comfortable? We've talked about COVID-19 a lot in this conversation and, and sort of some lessons learned. And COVID-19 meant many things for many different people. When we talk about the lessons, particularly in how it applies to HIV, what are some of those lessons learned during the pandemic? The legacies have to be, first, that we do different kinds of research, that we really are thinking about more community participatory, community-centered research that allows us to understand the questions that communities are asking and our challenging researchers to use participatory methods uh, employing more diverse researchers and staff to help to address those answers as well. It means using data differently. You know, at the height of the pandemic in London, I could tell you where we had the highest incidence of COVID, where we had the lowest vaccination rates, and where we had the COVID buses, the vaccine buses, geo-plotted geo uh, across the city, and where we could get vaccines to particular sites to give to communities in need. That level of data was phenomenal. That has to be part of our elimination journey for HIV. And then the third lesson is about what we did in the pandemic to really engage communities in creating solutions, whether it was in getting out COVID testing, whether it was tackling vaccine hesitancy, whether it was getting vaccines in the arms of culturally diverse communities. We could not have done this without partnering with our communities throughout the pandemic. We now view this as an essential part of our offer in health and care services. It's, it's very much a, a paradigm shift from previous iterations of how we incorporate interventions, which were usually thought among people in air-conditioned offices who didn't represent communities and then brought to communities and say, hey, we need your buy-in on this. What you're talking about here is instead of bringing it after the fact and getting a co-signature on it, is being co-collaborators from the beginning, which I think still is a lot of, is, is one of the challenges that we need to work on as we move forward. UNAIDS has talked about global goals to end the epidemic, right? And, and by 2030, there's an aim to have 95% of people living with HIV to know their status, 95% of all people diagnosed to be receiving antiretroviral therapy, and then 95% of those uh, on therapy to be virally suppressed. Where are we in the U.S. in terms of these 95, 95, 95 goals uh, across different populations? So I think it's important to have these like aspirational goals, and I think we want to keep them there and we want to continue to work towards them. In the U.S., we are not where we, we need to be, and in particular among certain groups, if we look at trans women um, or black same gender loving men in terms of engagement, in terms of getting treatment or tested and connected to care, so I think while we have cities that have reached some of these thresholds within the United States, we still have many parts of the country that are struggling. So the South, which has, is the epicenter of the HIV epidemic, is farther behind in terms of reaching these goals. And a lot of it has to do with many of the policies that exist within the South. You know, there are about seven states, I believe, in the South that have not expanded Medicaid People who are living with HIV or people who may be placed at risk for HIV are more likely to be poor and not have health insurance. So they are not going to be able to access HIV treatment and HIV prevention services. And so we, we see transportation is an issue if folks are in rural areas. So there are a lot of these policy and structural issues that if those are not remedied, it's really hard to create workarounds to them. How are you doing that in the UK? So I have the privilege of, of overseeing the government's new HIV action plan. And it really sets a, a bold target for ending HIV transmission in England by 2030. And I'm really pleased to say we had a report released only a day ago that really confirmed that we're on track to meet our interim targets. And that's phenomenal that within our lifetimes, we're going to be seeing this movement towards ending in-country transmission of HIV. In landing that program, we have built in a different focus on inequalities because we recognize that as we approach the uh, ending of HIV transmission, there's a real risk that infections are going to become more concentrated in people who have poor access to services, uh, inclusion health populations such as homeless people who are homeless, uh, asylum seekers, migrants, or people who are falling out of care because they're dealing with structural issues, uh, 
housing, uh, uh, jobless, uh, or people who feel that the systems are not speaking to them in ways that they need to. So uh, for s people who don't trust services because they feel services are systemically racist, for example, they're less likely to take their antiretrovirals and to be in care. So we are working with our communities to think about ways in which we continue to develop and deliver culturally competent HIV prevention, treatment, and care programs. We are delivering HIV services into the most vulnerable communities and co-producing and co-creating those services with affected communities. We're integrating peer support workers from diverse communities into the clinical pathway to ensure that we don't lose people because they feel overwhelmed by engaging with medical services. At the foundation of all of this is ensuring that we are tackling stigma and HIV stigma and how it's manifesting itself. We often use the words inequity and disparity interchangeably. In your eyes, what's the difference between the two? In my eyes, disparities are simply differences um, and they can be absolute. Uh, inequalities, however, go beyond just simply describing the differences which occur, but they recognize that the differences which are observed are a result of a range of systemic and structural differences which are occurring within society, which drive these inequalities. It begins to ask, why are we seeing the differences that we're seeing? How these differences are generated? Why they are perpetuated? And what we're going to do in a more comprehensive way to address them. So Dr. Fenton, in your eyes, what is at the root of the inequities that we currently see when it comes to HIV? The inequalities and the inequities we see in HIV reflect um, long-standing and entrenched inequalities within our society. And infectious diseases, whether HIV, tuberculosis, or COVID, really both shine a light on those systemic long-standing inequalities and often operate to exacerbate those inequalities. In many Western industrialized countries, we're living within racialized societies where we've had centuries of differences which have been baked into our societies, depending on our physical appearance, which advantages some communities, which disadvantages other communities, but which operates as a whole to ensure that it saps the energy and the potential of all of us because we're living in racialized societies. Now, these racialized societies then result in systemic differences and opportunities being baked in. So differences in education and educational attainment, differences in access to safe, warm, affordable housing, differences in access to social support, cohesive support within community to succeed and to thrive. These have an impact on the ways in which you access health services, the ways in which you trust healthcare services, the ways in which you remain engaged in healthcare services. What we see are the inequalities in HIV are product both of long-standing inequalities, whether it's your life chances, differences by your demographic characteristics, age, uh, gender, um, race, ethnicity, uh, your social conditions in which you live, uh, your housing, employment, your degree to which you're able to benefit from support from your communities uh, and employment opportunities. And then finally, the, the structural issues, whether government policies, um, uh, structural racism. When we have these infectious diseases appearing, why do they operate to widen inequalities? And they widen inequalities for a number of reasons. First, because often there's stigma associated with acquiring these infections. Uh, we saw this with HIV, we saw it with COVID, and stigma has a material impact on people pre presenting to be diagnosed, people sharing their diagnosis with others and getting the support that they need, or people remaining engaged in care. So in an environment where you have stigma operating with an infectious disease such as HIV, that worsens the inequality. So Dr. Blackstock, what is needed if we're going to create a person-centered approach to HIV care? I think we need to, first of all, ensure that the care that people are receiving who are living with HIV, that that is allowed to happen with a holistic approach and that that can all happen ideally in one place. We know that having like a one-stop shop type model where someone can come see their primary care or their HIV doc um, is really helpful. And then they could also see the social worker and a mental health provider and that there are other 
folks that are there who can also support, you know, their engagement can help connect them to other services. We've been very fixated on this like one lab, the viral load, and whether that's suppressed or not. But then like, what is a person's quality of life? Many people are suppressed, but they may be struggling with with substance use, with depression, with anxiety, with all these other issues that if you just looked at that viral load, you would have no idea. So I think we need to have like more comprehensive, holistic measures of health in terms of seeing whether are we really succeeding or not. I would love to know from you, what gives you hope and efforts to end the HIV epidemic? So I would say my patients, like I am always in awe of them, their commitment often to their health. You know, even when some people have had struggles and have had to fall out of care, they've come back in. Um, they've been so brave in, in just like living their lives and being themselves. So also like thinking about a lot of innovative models of care that we're seeing. I feel like the pandemic in particular sort of put more of a spotlight on, you know, mobile outreach, telehealth. So all of these, I think all these modalities, I think that were really underused prior to the pandemic would love to see us continue to to use them and innovate on them so that we can meet people where they are. Kevin, what is a, an example of a UK program that takes a person-centered approach uh, when it comes to HIV? So one of the exciting programs that we have been testing here in London is integrating or peer support, uh, support uh, for people living with HIV with clinical care. And that enables us to at the point of diagnosis uh, with HIV, and as people are being immediately linked to care, to ensure that we are linking them immediately to peer support workers. And the conversations that are able to be had at that point are qualitatively different to the conversations that clinicians are able to have. Because the peer support workers from our voluntary sector organizations coming from communities can speak about the emotions around the diagnosis, the support that people have, their hopes and fears about their diagnosis, where to find support, and to link them with a range of other tools and support that clinical services can't do. So that's a a really tangible example of that person-centered approach. Dr. Blackstock, question for you. How do differences in how health is administered in different countries impact HIV care? I think when we see countries that provide for instance, universal health care to everyone where everyone's able to access HIV treatment if they're HIV positive. We see improved outcomes in those countries compared to countries where there may be a more fragmented healthcare system where not everyone has health insurance coverage. So for instance, here in the United States, we have um, a public health insurance system, Medicaid and Medicare. We have people who have commercial health insurance, but we also have millions of Americans who are uninsured. And so we see access to care sort of tracking with that. For instance, in the South, where Medicaid has not been expanded, we see that individuals are less likely to be able to be to engage with HIV treatment, with HIV prevention services, HIV testing. Dr. Fenton, how can we do better? You've, you've given us a lot of great examples of what's going on in the UK, but if we're going to end the HIV epidemic, what are some of the elements needed in health systems to actually get us there? A few things I think are absolutely essential. Number one, we need a vision for the journey that we're going to be on, right? And that has to be collaborative. It has to be shared. It has to be comprehensive. It has to focus hearts and minds. It has to be supported politically. Second, I think we need to really understand what are the barriers to moving forward. You know, is it poor access to services? Is it failure to address inequalities? Or is it uh, inability to get the right drug in the right place to the right people? We know rural and coastal areas of the country, um, access to HIV testing, HIV services is a real problem. And that's where we're seeing more and more late diagnosis of HIV appearing. This means that we have got to focus on specific programs to deal with that. We know that although PrEP is available, too many people who are in need of PrEP and who would benefit from it are not getting it. So we're developing and have put in place specific programs to think about PrEP access. I would love to know if you, Kevin, what are your hope uh, in efforts to end the HIV epidemic? I hope that the lessons that we've learned over the past four decades and the lives that we have lost and the people who we have loved and who we've lost, but the people who are going to stand to benefit from all of our collective efforts and experiences, that we will continue to ensure that this journey is not in vain. Um, We're at the point where we have tough choices to make, 
to both end this epidemic and ensure we have healthier lives for generations to come. And my hope is that we will seize this moment. We will seize the lessons from the COVID pandemic, seize the lessons of more than four decades of the HIV pandemic, and push forward towards the 2030 goals with a resolve that we need to have to get there. My other hope is that the lessons, both from COVID, from HIV, will continue to do that work of transformation that we spoke about today. Um, we cannot have gone through our experiences over the last few years and not emerge from that with a laser-like focus on understanding inequalities and tackling them. We cannot go back to where we were pre-pandemic. We cannot go back to where we were when we had all these inequalities manifesting itself in the HIV pandemic and not being addressed. Now we have to have that hope that this becomes part and parcel of how we do business in ending this epidemic. One final question before we wrap up, Dr. Blackstock. What does the end of the HIV epidemic look like for you? So when I think of the end of the epidemic, I think of a world in which everyone has what they need to, to thrive. Because I think the epidemic, again, represents these sort of these cracks in society. Like it represents these inequities. Um, and so if everyone is getting you know, the housing that they need, they are able to support themselves, they have, they have jobs that allow them to have a, more than a living wage, they have access to health care, like that is what the end of the epidemic really, really, I think, means. Dr. Fenton, what does the end of the HIV epidemic look like for you? As an epidemiologist, it's about how low are the numbers? Are we seeing declining trends? When do we declare victory? As a policymaker, it's about who declares victory and at what level does at, when does that victory become declared? And we've seen this with other ends of epidemic, whether it's Ebola in West Africa, whether it's the COVID pandemic, where, you know, policymakers may declare the end of an epidemic when actually what's really happening is that in poor, marginalized rural communities, you're still seeing ongoing transmission and those communities get left behind. So from a policy perspective, we also need to, to challenge ourselves to say we're not leaving anyone behind as we approach the end of this epidemic. And finally, from a human perspective, the ability to vision and envision an end to the epidemic where we look at each other and say, actually, what have we learned and how have we supported each other as we've got to this point? And how do we celebrate together and realize that actually this harrowing experience of this pandemic has helped us as a humanity to move forward in ways that we could never have imagined had we not gone through this experience. Thank you both so much for the conversation we've had today. Build it and they will come. This statement may sound nice in theory, but as we've learned from our guests today, it simply is not true. If we really want to create systems that meet the needs of those who are often left out of healthcare, we can't expect them to meet us in the middle. We have to go the extra mile and meet them where they are. That takes designing systems that put people at the center and provides care for those who need it most. Not just today, but tomorrow and every day after. If you like what you heard today, don't forget to subscribe to Zero Hour wherever you get your podcasts. And you can check us out on YouTube as well. For more information, feel free to visit us at GileadHIVtogether.com. This presentation is protected by U.S. and international copyright laws and owned by Gilead Sciences. The podcast should not be copied, reproduced, or distributed in whole or in part without express permission from Gilead Sciences. The views expressed in this podcast are not necessarily those of Gilead Sciences.